Are you able to recognize these things? Can you tell what that is? Other than just a bunch of lines. The next one. And the next one. And the next one. Okay, now these next slides show what these things really are. There you go. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. See, unless you are an origami expert, you would have no idea what all of those fold and crease lines on the paper are going to become in the hands of the artist. Our lives are like origami paper. Our lives are filled with folds and creases of all kinds, and it's hard to know what we're becoming as we are being bent and pressed and pushed and folded and creased and smushed. But the artist at work in our lives knows exactly what he's doing, and when he's finished, we'll be astounded by the beauty that he's created in us. We're going to be completing a major section of the book of Genesis today. The focus of the story over the past several weeks, including today, has been Jacob. Beginning next time in Genesis 37, we'll enter into a new major section of the book, which will focus on Jacob's son, Joseph. So you have that to look forward to. But last time, we looked at the tragic and disturbing story told in Genesis chapter 34. It started with Jacob's daughter, Dinah, going into the local town, and a young man there who happened to be the son of the leader of the town, he saw her and he was immediately captivated by her beauty. But rather than seeking to establish a relationship with her and her family in a proper way, he forced himself on her and he raped her. Afterwards, the young man and his father asked Jacob for Dinah's hand in marriage. Jacob's sons were furious about what this young man had done to their sister. So they dealt treacherously and deceptively with them. They said that they would agree to the marriage if all of the men in the town got circumcised. Well, because of the influence of the young man's father, all of the men in the town agreed to be circumcised that very day. Then while the men were all in their beds recovering from their operations, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, they snuck into town and they slaughtered all of the men. The other sons looted the town, taking everything of value. Well, Jacob, he was horrified when he learned what his sons had done. The depth of their violence was unthinkable. And Jacob was terrified that when the people of the surrounding towns discovered what his sons had done, they would seek revenge and destroy Jacob's whole clan. Confused and frightened, he didn't know what to do or where to go. The Lord told him to go to Bethel and settle there, the place where Jacob had first encountered the Lord when he was fleeing from his brother Esau many years earlier. So that's where they went. And the Lord protected Jacob's family so that the other peoples did not seek revenge for what they had done. We're picking the story up today in Genesis chapter 35, verse 6. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. So Jacob and his group, they arrived safely at Bethel, that special place where he had had that unusual dream of the stairway to heaven and the Lord had spoken to him, promising to take care of him, to bring him back to this land of Canaan. Jacob at that time had taken the rock that he had slept on that night when he had that dream and he set it up as a pillar to commemorate the spot. And he gave the name Bethel to the place, which means house of God. 
Well, now Jacob builds an altar and he gives the place the new name El Bethel, which means God of Bethel or God of the house of God. Jacob's connection with the Lord has become more relational and personal. His focus is now on the God of this place rather than on the place itself. See, the first time that he was there years before, he was captivated by the idea that God was in this place. Now he's captivated by the Lord himself. It's similar to the shift that takes place when we come into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Before that time, out of respect for God, we might refer to the church building as the house of God, God's house. But after we are in a personal relationship with God through Jesus, our focus changes to the Lord rather than this building that is used to represent him in our mind. The God we're worshiping is what matters rather than the place where worship is taking place. We are captivated with him. Jacob has become a worshiper of God, like his grandfather Abraham before him, rather than simply an acknowledger of God. I pray each of us also are real worshipers of God and not just acknowledgers of God. I mean, it's, it's not enough for us to simply acknowledge the existence of God. I mean, that's a good start. You've got to start there. But the Lord wants us to know him. To be in relationship with him. He gave his son Jesus Christ so that we can become his sons and daughters. Adopted into his family. Brought to life spiritually. Given the character of Jesus. And given a new future with him that extends even beyond physical death. He wants us to know him. Not just acknowledge that he exists. Verse 8. It says, Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak outside of Bethel. So it was named Alon Bakuth. We have this interesting bit of information about Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, inserted into the story here. Rebecca, Jacob's mother, has not been mentioned since the end of Genesis chapter 27 when she gave Jacob instructions to flee to her brother Laban's house in Haran to be safe from his own brother Esau. It's believed that Rebekah died while Jacob was staying with Laban. When we first met Rebekah, she was a young woman working as a shepherdess for her father. And you remember that she left and she traveled back to Canaan with Abraham's servant to marry Isaac. And her father gave her her nurse, Deborah, as a going away present. Now, a nurse in those days was not the same as a nurse in our own day. Deborah had been Rebecca's caretaker from the time she was a newborn baby. As Rebecca grew up, Deborah continued to be one of her most trusted and valued servants. It's unusual, very unusual, that a female servant would be mentioned like this in the scripture in the story, in the history. And I believe she is mentioned and honored like this, being buried under this special oak tree at Bethel because of the exemplary life that she lived. She was deeply loved and respected by the people in this family. She had selflessly served this family for three generations. The oak tree where she is buried was named Alon Bakuth, which meant oak of weeping. Oak of weeping. She would be greatly missed by these people. She left behind a tremendous legacy which highlights the value of a life spent in faithful service to others. See, people like Deborah are largely ignored by society, aren't they? Taken for granted, forgotten, overlooked, not considered of much value, really. But they're not overlooked and ignored by the Lord. He sees them. Jesus said even a cup of water given in his name would be rewarded by the Lord. Deborah was noticed and honored for her loving service. 
given to Rebekah and her parents, and then to the family of Isaac and Rebekah, and then to the family of Jacob and his children. Jesus, he notices the selfless service that you give too, even when no one else does. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. And in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we we do not give up. Verse 9, the story continues. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, or Haran, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him, Bethel. So the Lord appears to Jacob a second time at Bethel, and he affirms the things that he had said to Jacob in previous encounters. The Lord changed Jacob's name to Israel that night that Jacob had that mysterious wrestling match with the Lord. And now the Lord reminds Jacob that his name is now Israel. Jacob will no longer be known as the one who takes hold of another person's heel, a deceiver, a usurper, but he will be known as one who takes hold of God and doesn't let go of him. Jacob is now in relationship with God, struggling with God, clinging to God. The Lord also reaffirms the covenant promises that he had made first to Abraham and then to Isaac, and now he makes to Jacob, giving his descendants the land of Canaan, promising to make them into a great nation of people, promising to bless the whole world through them. Jacob then sets up a monument to commemorate the Lord's appearance to him. And as we noted earlier, Jacob, he has become a true worshiper of the Lord, like his grandfather Abraham before him. Verse 16, Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks er, marks Rachel's tomb. While traveling south toward Ephrath, whose more familiar name to us is Bethlehem, Rachel gave birth to her second child, a son. Sadly, she dies while giving birth to him. Before dying, Rachel gave the child the name Ben-Oni, which means son of my trouble. Fortunately for the child, Jacob overruled that name choice and gave him the name Benjamin instead, which means son of my right hand. This was Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife. The woman he loved so intensely that he had been willing to work 14 years for her father in order to have her as his wife. There's no question that his heart aches over the loss of Rachel. Israel moved on again, or Jacob moved on again. Remember, Jacob and Israel are the same person. And pitched his tent beyond Migdal, Eder, while Israel, or Jacob, was living in that region. Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, And Israel, or Jacob, heard of it. So more suffering visits Jacob. Reuben, his firstborn son, betrays him in one of the most unimaginable ways. 
Reuben has an incestuous relationship with Jacob's concubine, Bilhah. You might remember Bilhah had been the personal servant of Rachel, who she then gave to Jacob to have children through. Bilhah was the mother of Reuben's brothers, Dan and Naphtali. Jacob had 12 sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's servant Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's servant Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. So these are the 12 sons of Jacob, or the 12 sons of Israel, which will become the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, we might think that God would have chosen a finer, more upstanding family to use as his avenue for revealing himself to the world and being the lineage for his son Jesus Christ to enter our world as Messiah. Instead, the family that the Lord chose to use is as messy as we can imagine a family being. These 12 sons of Jacob, they come from four different women. A mixed family, if there ever was one. Among these 12 sons, some of them are guilty of incestuous relationships. Some of them are guilty of heartless slaughtering of innocent people. Some of them are guilty of seeking the murder of one of their own brothers. They are undoubtedly guilty of a thousand lesser sins. Why would the Lord choose this group of people? Perhaps to help us understand that it is by his good grace and kindness that we are given a new life through Jesus Christ rather than because of something that we do to deserve it. See, in this messy makeup of the family of Jacob, we have a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 4 through 9, Paul wrote this. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And we see that same thing exemplified in these people. Oh, they're a messy group, but so are we. God loves us. Verse 27. It says, Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So this chapter ends with the death of Isaac, Jacob's father. He'd lived a long, full life and was gathered to his people. Jacob has faced a lot of suffering and loss since returning to his homeland of Canaan. I mean, one might think that Jacob would have experienced great blessing and reward when he came back to the land of promise. Not so. Here's a quick summary. When he came back, he learned of his mother Rebecca's death. His only daughter Dinah is raped. 
In retaliation, his sons brutally slaughter all of the men in the town of Shechem. And they put Jacob's entire family in danger of reprisal from the surrounding towns. The much-loved family servant of three generations, Deborah, dies. She'd been like a grandmother to him. Rachel, the wife he loved with all his heart, dies while giving birth to his son Benjamin. His son Reuben violates his trust in an unthinkable way by committing incest with his concubine Bilhah. And then finally, his father Isaac dies. Oh, his life is full of suffering. We all face difficulties in this life. No one gets a special card that lets him out of the realities of this life. The broken dreams, the unexpected tragedy and heartbreak, the betrayals, the death of people we love. What's different about being a child of God is that we don't go through life alone. The Lord is with us and he gives us strength to face the difficulties. He doesn't always take the bad stuff out of our life, but he always gives us what we need to live through it. Genesis chapter 36, which we are not going to read, provides a summary account of the descendants of Esau. Esau's descendants will become known as the Edomites. Now, because the story of Genesis will change focus from Jacob to Joseph, beginning with the next chapter, I want to close today by considering the big picture view of Jacob's personal life up to this point for a moment. See, we have observed a transformation that has taken place in Jacob over the course of time. And it's important for us to see that. When we first meet Jacob in Genesis chapter 25, he is this deceiving, scheming cheat, willing to go to any lengths to get what he wants. You might remember the name Jacob means heel catcher, a figurative expression referring to someone who takes advantage of others, a schemer. Jacob fought with his twin brother Esau while they were still in their mother's womb over who would be born first. Later, after they had grown up, Jacob, he tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright as the firstborn son. When his father Isaac was an old man, blind and bedridden, Jacob deceived him into giving Jacob the final family blessing, which Isaac had intended to give to Esau. Then Jacob had to leave home, fleeing from his brother Esau, who wanted to kill him because he had taken both the family inheritance and the family legacy. And as Jacob was fleeing from his brother on his way to his uncle Laban's in Haran, afraid, alone, stripped of everything that he knew and cared about, facing an uncertain future, Jacob had a personal encounter with the Lord which began to change him. The Lord spoke to Jacob in this very unusual dream of a stairway between earth and heaven. The Lord essentially said to him, I am the God of your grandfather Abraham, I am the God of your father Isaac, and I will be your God too. Jacob, he goes, eh, maybe, maybe. He had this very conditional acceptance of God's offer. He said, if you will be with me and watch over me and provide for me and bring me back to my homeland safely, then I'll let you be my God. Really? Well, it wasn't pretty, but those were the first steps in Jacob's relationship with God, which would grow over the years. And after some 20 years in Haran with Laban, the Lord told Jacob it was time to return to his homeland of Canaan. So Jacob gathered together his wives and his children, his many flocks and servants and other possessions, and he headed back to Canaan. 
And as he neared the border of Canaan, he had this dramatic encounter with the Lord one night. Jacob had sent messengers ahead earlier that day to let his brother Esau know that he was coming back home to Canaan. And the messengers came back with a message from Esau to tell Jacob that he was coming to meet him with 400 of his men. Jacob assumed that meant the worst, that Esau was coming to slaughter them. Well, facing what he believed would be his annihilation the next day, Jacob, he sent everyone and everything across the river, leaving himself alone that night. And then, when he thought it couldn't get any worse, he found himself fighting for his life in this wrestling match with a mysterious stranger that just showed up out of nowhere. And they fought all night long. Then, as dawn began to break, the stranger He just touched Jacob's hip and he crippled him. Realizing then who it is that he had been wrestling with, he grabbed hold of the Lord and he refused to let go of him until the Lord would bless him. The Lord told him his name would no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because he had struggled with God and with people and he had prevailed. Jacob would no longer be known as the one who takes hold of another person's heel, but he would be known as one who takes hold of God and doesn't let go. Jacob is in a relationship with God, struggling with God, hanging on to God with his life. Well, Jacob, he set up camp near the town of Shechem, and he built an altar there, and he called it El Elohi Israel, which means El is the God of Israel, or to say even more simply, the Lord is my God. The Lord is my God. Jacob had become a true worshiper of the Lord as his his God, and he had fully accepted the Lord as his. And then after the terrible events that took place at Shechem involving his daughter and his sons, Jacob moved his people to Bethel. And on the way there, he had everyone throw away their foreign gods and purify themselves so they would be ready to worship the Lord. When they arrived at Bethel, Jacob, he built another altar to the Lord, and he named it El Bethel, which means God of the house of God. His focus was no longer on the fact of this place is where God was, but his focus is on the God. Jacob's worship of the Lord, it has deepened still further now, see? Jacob, he's been transformed by degrees throughout his life. And the same is true with us. As we walk with the Lord through this life, our relationship with the Lord is a lifelong pursuit. When we first encounter the Lord, we're we're not immediately transformed into some angel. We begin a relationship with him, and it's ugly. It's confusing. It's full of uncertainties. And, you know, we have all these ideas, and they end up being wrong as we grow and we learn. But it's the beginning of a relationship, and we move through life with the Lord as our God. But only by degrees do we begin to understand what that means, the implications of it, the wonder of it, the demands of it. And as we continue to walk with the Lord, we become more and more intertwined with him and his purposes. We take on more and more of his character. We embrace more and more his vision and mission. Our whole life is a slow, steady progression toward the Lord, making him our God, giving him our life and devotion. It takes time to make a man or woman of God. How much time? A whole lifetime. I've said this before. It takes a lifetime. See, our lives are like that origami paper. Our lives are filled with folds and creases of many kinds, and it's hard to know what we are becoming as we're being bent and pressed and pushed and folded and creased. But the artist at work in our life. He knows exactly what he's doing. 
And when he's finished, we'll be astonished by the beauty that he's created. 1 John 3, 2. John writes, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When you feel discouraged about the progress of your own life with the Lord, when you begin wondering if you will ever get to that place with the Lord that you long to be at, I want you to remember Jacob and the journey that the Lord walked with him. The Lord is going to complete the good work he started in you. You just keep walking with him. Philippians 1.6, Paul wrote, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for Jacob's story. And what a powerful picture it is of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way that you reach into our lives, messy and broken as they are, and you rescue us, Lord. You establish a relationship with us, and, and the, you walk with us through this life, through all of the stuff, the sin and the failure and the, just, the, just the insanity that we live. And you continue to change us. Making us your children. Building the character of Jesus in us. We're going to be astonished at what you have made when it's revealed. Lord, I pray for each person here this morning that we would trust you with our life. We would continue to walk with you, Lord. And I pray if there's anyone here today that has not really started that relationship with you yet, has not asked Christ to come into their life and begin to change them, I pray that today is the day they would do that. You just say, Lord, I... I want you to rescue me and give me a new life. I want you to be my God. And I don't even fully understand what all that means yet. But Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and you begin to change me. Make me into that person you want me to be. Oh, Lord, you're so good to us. Bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen.